Canto 10, Chapter 57. The chapter is entitled, Such or Did Murder, The Jewel Returned, Verses 35 through 40. Evam Samadhi Alakaha. Evam Samadhi Alakaha. Svapaka Taneo Manin. Svapaka Taneo Manin. Adaya Vasat Satchana. Adaya Satchana. Dadusura Samadrabam. Dadusura Samadrabam. Evam Samadhi Alakaha. was left in your care by Sakadamba, who is still with you. Indeed, we have known this all. There's a quick word of one line. Lord Krishna's treatment of Akura here confirms that he is actually a great devotee of the Lord. Text 37, this has a quick word. Since Satrajit had no sons, his daughter's sons should receive his inheritance. They should pay for memorial offerings of water and pinda, clear the grandfather's outstanding debts, and keep the remainder of the inheritance for themselves. 
Shiva Sri Hara Swami quotes the following Shruti injunction regarding inheritance. Patni Dura Duhitaras Chaiva Pitra Bhattaras Tata Tatsutta Gotraja Bandhu Sishisa Brahmana Charinaha. This is very cultural in terms of how money gets properly placed. The inheritance first goes to the wife, then, if the wife has passed away to the daughters, then to the parents, then to the brothers, then to the brothers' sons, then to the family members of the same culture as the deceased, and then to his disciples, <coughs> including brahmacharis. Very uh, cultural, traditional way of making sure that inheritance got to where it's supposed to be. Nowadays, everybody fights <coughs> over between each other the court. <laughs> And sometimes they even plot against each other, to destroy each other to get the money. That's called family life. Comfortable <laughs> 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 reasons. It's a boy's life you have. Yes? Sri <laughs> 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 Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur adds that since Satraja had no sons, since his wives were killed together with him, and since his daughter Sachibana was not interested in the Shamatapa jewel, which constitutes the inheritance, he rightly, he rightfully belonged to her sons. In Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Srila Prabhupada explains, Lord Krishna indirect indicated by this statement that Sachibana was already pregnant and that her son would be the real claimant of the jewel and would certainly take the jewel from Akura if he tried to conceal it. This is really intricate problem. This is like, this is intrigue, spiritual intrigue. Translation, nevertheless, the Jews should remain in your care, Krishna is still speaking, untrustworthy to Kura, because no one else can keep it safely. But please show the jewel just once, since my elder brother, Balra, does not fully believe what I have told him about it. <laughs> it gets really kind of you know, mundane. <laughs> Balaram doesn't believe Krishna. Krishna has to prove to Balaram that he's not telling a lie. <laughs> In this way, most, almost the fortunate one, you will pacify my relatives. Everyone knows you have the jewel, for you are now continually performing sacrifices on altars of gold. Krishna has revealed that Kura has somehow already gotten the jewel. Purport. Although technically Sachibama's son had a right to the jewel, sons, Lord Krishna decided to leave the jewel in the care of Akura, who was using the jewel's wealth to continue to perform the religious sacrifice. Indeed, Akura's ability to perform such rituals on altars of gold was an indication of the jewel's potency. Now for today's verse. The translation thus, shamed by Lord Krishna's conciliatory words, the son of Swapaka brought out the jewel from where he had concealed it in his clothing and gave it to the Lord. The brilliant gem shone like the sun. We can see in this chapter how a valuable jewel caused so much intrigue, violence, and suffering. This is certainly a good lesson for those who desire a trouble-free free spiritual life. Sorry, that again. We can see in this chapter how a valuable Jew caused so much injury, violence, and suffering. It's certainly a good lesson for those who desire a trouble-free spiritual life. Om Pagyan Kamiyan Vasyan Vyodhya Chaksu Unmeditamena Tasma Sri Urvena Sri Chaitanya Manobi Stones Dati Kami Ruta Sai Kupa Kadama Yamdati Sai Kadati Kami Sri Krishna Chaitanya Guru Nitya Hindu Sri Advaita Guru Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare 
This is probably a, quite a unique story within the whole Srimad Bhagavatam. Because Krishna is really trying to vindicate himself from being accused of being a murderer. <laughs> they thought that Krishna actually killed Sachi, Sachi Jit in order to get the jewel. But actually, Sachi Jit was killed by Sakadabha, who was later killed by the lion who stole the jewel from him. And then that jewel somehow got in the hand of Jambhava. And Krishna fought Jambhava in order to get the jewel back, but at the same time, he wound up getting the daughter of Jambhava as a wife, and that was Jambhava. It's a real interesting story. So Krishna has to clear his name here. So that's why he wants the jewel to come back into the visible thing, so just to show that you know, it wasn't him. And at the same time, he wanted to bring the jewel back into the public use again. Because everyone was thinking, you know, this jewel used to produce 60 mounds, 60 mounds of gold per day, just by its presence. And everyone who had it, you know, that their life was very, very auspicious. So what is, what is wealth? Wealth is luxury. And we say, Mother Lakshmi, she was actually called the goddess of fortune. She said, Parvam Vishwara, Jagina, Parvam Sivadu Mahalani Kijaya, Parvam So, Radharani, she is the source of all the criminal manifestations of the absolute truth. So Radharani expands into various manifestations of herself and what is Lakshmi Devi. Now Lakshmi Devi represents spiritual wealth. Or that wealth that is not subject to material time. But then her expansion is a manifestation of the other aspect of wealth, which is the Material wealth. So Lakshmi represents both the spiritual wealth and material wealth in the manifestation of the expansion. And we can just see in the story of Ram and Sita and uh, Ravana how Ravana captured Sita, which is the goddess of fortune. And he didn't get any fortune from that. He simply got a misfortune. He lost all his wealth. And he lost his kingdom, all his followers, and ultimately he lost his life. Because when wealth becomes the object of one's own selfish interests, it is one of the greatest havocs in the world. <laughs> because it's Lakshmi. And Lakshmi belongs to the lion, no one else. You can't have Lakshmi without the lion. You can have Lakshmi without the lion, but you can't. Not the real Lakshmi, you get the shadow, the reflection of that Lakshmi, which is the material manifestation of our existence, and you <coughs> simply get problems. As it says here, you see that this jewel, when it's used in the service of the Lord, it produces auspiciousness, glory to the persons who hold it, glory to the persons who benefit by the holder's presence, Everyone benefits. There's nothing wrong with wealth if it is connected to its source. But we see in this age, what do people fight over? Money or wealth. And it's not that they're not even fighting over wealth, they're fighting over paper, which is really just supposed to be symbolic of something valuable. But in itself, paper has no value. It is simply given some accreditation by the ruling party in political office. And if that changes, a piece of paper, you can use it to you know, put it in your pillow and sleep better. You know? That's all. It's just a piece of paper. You know? The people kill each other for paper. Papa used to say, real wealth actually is precious metals, such as silver and gold and platinum and other 
it was a rare and valuable challenge. But this piece of paper, which goes on well today, is a great cause of turmoil throughout the entire world. It's amazing. It's not amazing, it's kind of what we say absurd. <laughs> when you actually think about it. It's an absurd consideration. And we see great wars are falling over that. Family members. Just like there was a one who was a very famous wealthy cartoonist. And I'm, I'm not sure you all have heard of him. His name was Walt Disney. Yeah. Everybody knows about him. Minnie and Mickey Mouse. He, 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 modern Christian reflections of the universe of the world. People worship him. I knew a person who was absorbed in Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, all kinds of mice. He was just, you know, his whole life was just you know, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Sometimes we criticize each other. You're just a Mickey Mouse. It means you nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a slime statement. But this person became extremely wealthy and extremely famous for creating these fictitious characters which were publicized and broadcast to various kinds of media, which are still popular today. This goes back at least 60 years or more. And uh, so at one point, just before he died, he made his will where no one can get my fortune because I'm going to freeze my head, my body frozen, and then when I come back to life, after they find the secret of life, then I'll just resume my life. So therefore, don't touch my wealth. <laughs> so he put it in the hands of these strong lawyers. And no one could take the wealth, and then if he died, they froze his body in this machine. So everyone was waiting for a walk to return, right? <laughs> so, but the family members didn't like it. They wanted the wealth. So some were saying, well, you know, he's going to come back, so we shouldn't touch it, you know. Others were saying, well, he's dead, you know. <laughs> we want that money. So one day, unbeknownst to anybody, Someone snuck into the room where his body was in the freezer and pulled the plug out. <laughs> so he got dejuiced. <laughs> and therefore, you just look at the, how things go on in the material world. It's funny, but it's actually what is called a satire. It's a ridiculous comedy. <laughs> But it's actually serious for those who participate. This is a material world. The bodies can look at it and say, oh, people are just so nuts. You know? <laughs> but that's what goes on in material life. And this idea of money. And most people who have money, they don't know what to do with it. They usually put it in the bank, invest it in different things. And you know, sometimes they don't even spend it, they spend very little of it. And then when they die, somebody else gets it. <laughs> so it, this, this idea of money. And in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it explains that, that on the path of spiritual life, there are obstacles. There are obstacles. And there are two stalwart, powerful, mountain-like obstacles. This is mentioned in the second chapter of the first chapter, verse number 17, where it's explained that there are two very, very powerful obstacles that devotees should be aware of and not fall victim to. And that is wealth and attraction for the opposite sex. These two things are explained as being powerful immovable, almost immovable stumbling blocks. And we see from history how many great souls who have practiced spiritual life in a very powerful way at one time became victim of one of these two things. 
Lord Chaitanya says, Madhanam, 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 Madhanam. And so he makes that point just to explain that these three things, followers, wealth, and the pleasures of the association of the opposite sex, are the powerful stumbling blocks created by the material energy. And so one has to be wary of that. And therefore, practice devotional service in such a way as not to become victimized by that. So, wealth it should be used in the service of the Lord, must be used in the service of the Lord. And whatever <coughs> is needed to keep body and soul together, to live simply and nicely, then that is Krishna consciousness. And that makes life, what we say, progressive, happy. Because our happiness is only Krishna consciousness. There's no happiness in material things. Material things are, in, at best, necessities to live in this world, at best. A necessity is not an object of enjoyment. It's simply something that is required in order to, to fulfill the need, to, to support, not fulfill, but support the needs of the goal of life, which is, practice spiritual life. So we might say money is necessary, relationships are necessary, all these things fall into the category of necessity, but not as an object of enjoyment. That's, that's the understanding. So the enjoyment comes in our relationship with Krishna. That's where the enjoyment is. That's the only place where the enjoyment comes. So we see here how this jewel, which is very auspicious to have, when it be people who are involved with its what is it, caretaking became somewhat greedy. And what is greed? Greed is an expression of one's dissatisfaction with one's present situation. The spiritual life teaches us to become satisfied. This is a very important thing for devotees to understand that whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever you have, be satisfied. And as soon as you ex accept that, you can make tremendous spiritual progress in the end. In the, for our own self. Of course, we're never satisfied by the, the level of service we do. We want to do more service. So that this kind of dissatisfaction is spiritual. That's not material. But whatever you have, and whatever you are, whatever, because people look towards each, towards other situations as ways of, of betterment. I want to be like that person. I want to have what that person has, or this position of power, or you know, material things. It's like somebody, you know, you see people like somebody else's wife. And you go, <laughs> what happens? It's a mess. <laughs> you know, it's just like, and, you know, it's just like, it's like I, was, I preach in prisons. And, uh, you know, so I went to one prison one day. When devotee works in the prison as a counselor, and he started a preaching program there. So when I was there the first time, one tall man came up to me and said, Chai Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. And he paid full dollar bills. I was thinking, for an inmate? <laughs> That's pretty good. And then he got up, he said, my name is Sacha Krishna. <laughs> and then I found out he was a devotee of the Bodhi Amath, where he began initiation and everything. So then later I found out, you know, somebody was messing with his wife, so he killed him. <laughs> so that's what happens, you know. Uh, you know, the road is you can get implicated by situations like that. So, you know, you see when someone acts outside of the idea of, because even you take that small principle and expand it, that everything belongs to Krishna. So Prabhupada would say, and rightly so, that if you take more than you actually need to keep body and soul together, you're, you're a thief. 
not a very nice way of saying it, but actually it's, that's the shell shock. Because everything belongs to the, the person who created it, and it, it has a purpose. And if you go beyond, Ishava Shandam Sarva, Yaktija, Jivam Tachida, Tena, Jaktena, Bundijaha. Ma, what is that last one? Ma, because it's, because it's still Danam. Danam. That this verse is very, very essential to understand how we have it. It says, everything animate and inanimate in this world is owned and controlled by the Lord. And therefore, one should take the quota and be happy. And it says in the next verse that if you live like this, you can live for hundreds of years. In other words, you can aspire to live a long life because you're happy. So this is a very important part of of our practice of spiritual life. It's foundational, it's supportive, it's important that we learn how to deal with the material energy in such a way that we don't become implicated, which destroys our ability to practice Krishna consciousness. So therefore, the, the idiom is simple living and high thinking. But you know, the material world is geared or programmed to give you as much what we say, information how you are not happy. Right? That's the whole idea of, of Western society, just to tell you we are not happy. And if you get this, or be this, or do this, then you can be happy. That's the whole point. Right? And people buy into that. This, you know, clothes, <coughs> position, power, money, whatever. And that goes on. The spiritual life is, you're perfect. You're part and person of Krishna. You don't need anything. In fact, you don't even need food <laughs> or air. <laughs> but because you have a material body, it needs it. <laughs> so because you're in it, therefore you keep it going. But you're perfect as an individual, and that's your identity. So if we understand that, then we will just take what we need to keep body and soul together. And that way we can maximize time and energy for practicing Krishna consciousness. And that's the most important thing. And but people in this world, they're never satisfied. And society just teaches, don't be satisfied. Get more, you know, get more, get more, get more. And this greed, Krishna explains this, you know, he says, Rag, what is that? Sri Bhagavan Uracha, Ma. Kama Esha, Krona Esha, Raja Guna, Samud Bhava, Maha Shano, Maha Papa, Dudheha, Bihavari, no. That lust, or the desire to enjoy material things, when it gets frustrated, it turns into wrath, or Krona, and then that destroys the whole world. Krishna says it's all the value of sinful activity of the entire world. So these are the these are the real enemies of the soul, and therefore, in contact with so many opportunities to enjoy material offerings, one has to see who belongs to Krishna. I mean, belongs to Krishna. I take what I need, and that's all. And if you live like that, you're happy. So we see here such intrigue over this very valuable jewel. I mean, I mean seeing devotees. I mean, they become deadly enemies over one. I mean, really, I've seen it. It's, you know, they just stand and talk to each other and look at each other because of some inappropriate dealings on an, on an economic level. And there was one story where Two devotees wanted to start a business. And so they asked this other devotee to lend them money. So he lent them the money. And after the first year, the business was booming. So rather than paying them back, they decided to reinvest the, the, the profits in the business again and expand the business even more. So they did, and then after that, everything went down, and they lost everything. So the devotee who lent him the money wanted his money back. 
but they didn't have anybody. So one of them said, well, it's not my fault that the business went down, it was his fault, my partner. And his partner said, no, it was his fault. So they were fighting who should pay him back, and nobody wanted to pay him back because they were blaming each other for the fall of the business, and therefore that person never got the money. And then everybody became enemies. So you can see, even in Krishna consciousness, if things are, if we become attached to, you know, happiness through material endeavors, we create enemies automatically, or we can be in a position to break down nice relationships. You know, families fall apart, empires fall apart, everything falls apart over, you know, Lakshmi. Mm -hmm. And the example is Ram Lila. I mean, that is the prime example. If you study Ram Lila, we understand how his wealth became a source of, I mean, Ravana. I mean, he had everything. But he didn't have one thing. He wasn't satisfied. And that's the nature of wealth on a material level. The more you get, the more you want. Just like I talk to devotees sometimes, and they're very successful in their practice of you know, occupation outside. But because of that success, they get more and more opportunities for more success, more opportunities for promotion and money. And pretty soon there's so much absorbed in that, and they have no time for practice and Krishna consciousness. Their, their success pulls them more and more into their arena of, you know, being, being busy in that. So that's a danger. That's a danger. So we have to be very careful in our Krishna consciousness. Whatever you have, see it as Krishna. And try to live simply. Simple living is nice. It's a, society used to be very simple. People used to be simple, right? Life is more agrarian, more rural. Now our life is a city. Prabhupada said city means hell. <laughs> and he said that specifically about London, right? You go out the door, I don't have to tell them. You know, you go out the door, and it's just like, a, you know, it's one of the, t I guess it's the 29th half. There's 28 that I missed in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of these maybe the, the combination of all 28 together. That's <laughs> one of them. That's kind of what kind of hell you can possibly think. So, yeah, we don't get attached. It's just this, this is the way it is. And this is due to the idea, this is frantic living. Because society becomes so absorbed in sense gratification and economic gain, but they become literally mad. It becomes a total madness. It's a nut house. And nothing makes sense anymore. The world is not that. So but we should be very careful not to get pulled into this false value system. And, and Bob, I said that when we were at Guru and Dhabi, well, I was teaching the Grihastas there how to live. This course was a farm community. And Prabhupada went so far as to draw on paper a picture of the house that we should build for Grihastas. And we, we did. We called it the Prabhupada house. <laughs> and it was a very simple dwelling with a couple rooms. Had everything you need, but it was small. Became the Prabhupada house and the houses were living in. So, Prabhupada even showed us that this simple living is foundational in our practice of Krishna consciousness. In the city, it's very difficult to practice Krishna consciousness in the simple environment because we're surrounded by so many necessities, apparently. But therefore, it's always a struggle to live simply and practice Krishna consciousness. And see, whatever you have and whatever is in existence belongs to Krishna, including our money bodies. And that way we can be happy.
Is he with him? Or was he alive? Well, the rich of Shrihar, he had nothing. And Lord Chaitanya wanted to give him just to show his love for Kalmach, with anything he wanted. And he offered him whatever you want. You can have, you know, you can have a, a planet. <laughs> you can have a, you know, a, a nice dwelling. He was living in a little shack with holes in it. His clothes were so full of holes that he had to tie the holes together to so cover himself. He had nothing. And from day to day, he would just get a few pice and get a few pieces of vegetable. And that's all how he lived. And when Lord Shri, but he had so much, so much bhakti in his heart that when Lord Shri kind of offered him anything to do, he, all, he said to the Lord, well, why are you giving me trouble? I'm happy. <laughs> what do you want to give me all this stuff for? Mm -hmm. So he was happy. Of course, what is simple living? Simple living means not to be attached to whatever you have. Not to be attached to whatever you have. Use it in the service. Okay, so let's see how Krishna gets implicated. Apparently, in this very intrigue that's going on here. Let's see. It pretty much ends right here. It's a very interesting story. Any questions? Comments? Yes, Jan, you can No. Marge, you spoke about, uh, as you said here, the simplicity of how wealth can cause problems. We also see in Krishna's pastimes and also Lord Chaitanya's pastimes that there were some devotees who were quite affluent, quite wealthy. No. Um, so could you speak a little bit about Yeah. <coughs> Read the media. Yeah. But Lord Chaitanya revealed his qualities. <laughs> he couldn't actually reveal his qualities. <laughs> so although he had to so much, he was ostentatiously dressed very glamorously with very nice decorations, many servants. He wasn't attached to it. So there are devotees who have good high things. That's your karma. You know, if, you, if your karma allows you to have many things, then accept it. But to work hard for it, to endeavor for it, means to go outside of your, you know, just endeavor for what you need, that's all. And Prabhupada used to say, you can't be attached to either, you know, poverty or wealth. For some people who like, they like to live, you know, in the body. You know, I'll never buy anything. <laughs> he wears the same shoes for the last hundred years. <laughs> Got holes in it, socks in the same way. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's, it, that's this whole thing. I mean, he said, won't buy anything. I used to be like that too when I first joined. <laughs> But they told me, it's not right, Mara, you gotta look better, so I changed. <laughs> so there are people who are attached to nothing. <laughs> but if you're attached to nothing, that's another form of attachment. And if you're attached to a lot, that's obviously form of attachment. So you have to be attached to Krishna. And therefore, the word is prayasa, it's mentioned in Rupa Goswami's explanation and nectar of instructions how there are six things that destroy bhakti and what is only endeavoring for material things. So Bhakti Vinodha core comments on this and says that there needs to be a little prayasa for the houses. Just to make an endeavor to take care of basic needs. But that's all. And for one person, as opposed to another, it may slightly be different. But generally the principle is take what you need. Also. If you get wealth, use it for Krishna. Mm -hmm. 
there are devotees who live very nicely, but they're also using their wealth for Krishna service. So the idea, the principle is not to endeavor hard for you know, material things. Mm -hmm. If it comes, it comes. You get it, if you're supposed to get it, you won't get it, you're not supposed to get it. And even if you're not supposed to get it, and you get it, it doesn't give you what you need, because you're not supposed to get it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people are born in good situations, in part of good society. Jama Aishwara, Sutra Sri Vir. So Aishwara is wealth. And that by your past karma, you're born in a particular family or you have some particular abilities that allow you to get secure material wealth. So you may do that up to a certain point, but if your bhakti becomes stunted because of that, then you have to reconsider what's more important. So a lot of times we're too busy living, I mean too busy uh, living to actually take time to practice Krishna consciousness. We don't want that. You can tell. If you're if you're happy in your Krishna consciousness, then that's fine. But if you're not happy, if you're not satisfied, then you should see what do I need to adjust in order to facilitate you know, my advancement of Krishna. Any other questions? And so means what you need to practice Krishna consciousness. So, I just want to know if I understand correctly, is that, that what comes on its own accord easily to us sense it? It's sensed by Krishna. Or may also come by your karma. So, if you live like that, then you can work. Yeah, then you don't have to worry. But there's two categories, Krihastas and those who are outside of that ashram. So the you know the needs are different. So the sannyasis, brahmacharis are more dependent on the couple of facilities and others, whereas the Grahastras have to make a little endeavor in that direction in order to facilitate their needs because they're supposed to be the economic support of the society. So it says that the Grihastas make money, and then they also use the excess to support the other ashrams and support the practice of Krishna consciousness. So there's a, there's a certain principles that we have to see. So they're allowed to do that. But if they go too far and become too absorbed in that, then that inf interferes with their peace of mind and the practice of their Ashram service. That's a principle, but it's adjustable according to time, place, and person. Yeah. <laughs> I know one 
spiritual master in this time who won't give second initiation to anybody who has a job. Because <laughs> he says brahmanas don't work. <laughs> so he's a restrict. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you look at it from this scriptural point of view, it's a contradiction because brahmanas don't work for anybody. So where, where's the solution? The solution is Prabhupada wanted us to develop the Vanashram system where we have what is called self-sufficient communities where we produce what we need within the society and not depend on the society for what we need. So we haven't got to that point yet. In some areas they're doing it, in some areas they don't even think about it. But that's the actual goal. Okay. Because to work for others means, as Prabhupada said, to become a dog. And you wag your tail and say, my dear Mr. Employer, please give me some bones. <laughs> and then you have to sell your soul to someone else. And we see devotees have so many problems working for outside you know, even the environment, the association. Outside. So ideally, yeah, the Prabhupada's program is a non-ashram system. And he pushed that. Towards the very end of his stay with us, 1976, 77, he was really talking about ashram all the time. He wanted it. He said, this is my unfulfilled part of my mission. We have to establish these farm communities. There should be temples, city temples for preaching. He said, but we don't live in the cities. We live on our farms and we preach in the cities. The cities are for preaching. Farms are for the And that's what he wanted. And in some areas, the devotees are moving in that direction, but it's not going fast enough. So to work for others, yeah. Brahmins means. Brahmins give knowledge, they teach how to worship the deity, they accept charity of gifts, they put the charity back into the, into the Krishna consciousness movement. Like they're dependent, they're supposed to be. Because they give chance of their lives. Yes? Well, it, it's just thinking is if the problems aren't paid or it's just that they're remunerated with in a different way. Because they're still supported by the system that according to their karma, they just naturally have to take deeper shelter of Krishna. Whereas the Kshatriyas, they can live in a more opulent way according to their karma. Yeah, the, the tendencies are there, but that's why unless we organize it into a system, it's going to get people are going to do whatever they want, and then associate with the material energy just like the Just like I know many, I know many devotees who are actually shattered by nature, but they don't have any service within this time, so they go outside and teach non devotees how to fight. <laughs> Or they become good managers in companies. You know. The Shatriya has to manage. He has to, you know, that's his move. Yes, that's his move. And so there are devotees in our movement who have that tendency. I know one devotee who's a very good Vaishya. <laughs> and he's a millionaire, but he won't stop working <laughs> because he, that's his Vaishya tendency. His Vaishya tendency is so strong. So we have to organize that in a system where it becomes everything goes back into the Christian consciousness society. And people become satisfied by the work. But you're right, yeah, that tendency is there. That's why Prabhupada's, Prabhupada writes it back, back as early as 1974. He writes in his first chapter, Sri Mahabharata, he says that the duty of a spiritual master to observe his disciples and see how they should be engaged in devotional service. He should evaluate their nature and engage it accordingly. He said that was the purpose of Guru Kula. 
group, it was to train people in a dominical way, but then to see which persons didn't have that dominical tendency through the training, and then they could be trained in a different way, according to their nature. That's the whole system, the biological system. So, unless we do that, our society is not going to grow. Because that's foundational for the growth of the whole movement. <laughs> you know, like, you know, a place where there's the Pajaris, you know, they're all Shatris. Because they can't, they're always fighting with the Pajaris. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's not a job for a Shatri. <laughs> so, we have these tendencies, and we can't, you know, Krishna consciousness is mean. Papa said to take training and bring out your qualities and then engage it in Krishna purpose. Conscious, that is called Daivi Maharashtra. We're not into materialistic Maharashtra. We're into Daivi Maharashtra. Where we train devotees according to their natures, or allow them to accept training according to their natures, and then they can find satisfaction in serving Krishna in that way. In the beginning, you may do many different services, but after a while, if you don't find your nature within your Krishna, you won't find satisfaction in your Krishna consciousness. Right, Vichara? He's not going to call me for a session. No, I'm not for sure. Right? It's correct? No, we, if you work according to your nature, and use it to serve Krishna, not to satisfy your own ego, then you become satisfied, you become happy. And that's that's the whole social system. Daivi Vanashra. So Prabhupada wanted what we call Vanashram colleges. Radha Desh has started something. They're actually working to establish it now. They just started about a year back, this Vanashram college. So that's to train Brahmins, train uh, Kshatriyas, and the train Vaishyas. Training. Because basically Prabhupada said people are born in, with Sudra natures, but they have tendencies that are, what we say, covered over. So the training brings out that, those coverings like that. Emergency, you can do different services, but generally, if you follow your nature, and Krishna mentions it twice in the Bhagavad Gita, 335, 1846, he says, Work according to your nature. <laughs> Why does he say? I mean, he, he explains the, the verses, you know, the qualities of a Brahman, qualities of a Kshatriya, qualities of Vaisha, the Sutra characteristics, and then a few verses later, he explains everyone should work according to their nature. Yes. Well, Bhakti Vidya Puna Maharaj, uh, the one established in my book, that's the that's the right in training the Yeah, they're training the yeah. young men there. Yeah, that's a very good program. So unless we do it everywhere or have a system to allow devotees to, you know, come up to where they can actually find fulfillment in practicing Krishna consciousness. Devotees are surrendered. And they'll do anything, but you'll find that a lot of times they're surrendered, but they're not happy. They become happy when they actually engage according to their nature or something. Okay, so that's Prabhupada's program. And he really wanted it. 1977, in a room conversation with Ari Sari and a few others, he said, we must do it. In 1974, when he saw devotees leaving the movement, he said, before that, he said, just chant Hare Krishna. That's the panacea for all ills. But we were doing that, and still people were leaving. And Prabhupada said, well, it, it, then he said, it's not so easy to become a devotee. Now we have to establish this Vanarsha. We have to train devotees in order to stay fixed in their Krishna consciousness. 
So he saw that simply engaging in the Sankirtan movement was drawing people in, purifying them, but up to a certain level they were still f finding reasons to leave. There's no, once you come to Krishna God, there's no reason to leave. Everything is here. It's perfect. This philosophy is perfect. We just haven't developed a lifestyle to complement the philosophical teachings yet. Until we do that, we're working on it, and many areas are starting to improve. But until we do that, then we'll find there's always going to be problems in our, you know, our management, right? You know, how to engage devotees, how to cover the services, and at the same time keep the devotees happy in their Krishna conscious practice. Because people will gravitate towards their tendencies after a while. It's just the way they are. When we first started the movement, Prabhupada was doing emergency work. He knew he didn't have much time. He had his third heart attack in 67. The doctor told him that you were supposed to leave the world on that. Prabhupada <coughs> prayed for more time. And Krishna gave him 10 more years. So Prabhupada didn't really have time to establish the Van Ashram. He was just spreading the Sankirtan movement, opening temples, <coughs> initiating devotees, <laughs> spreading Krishna consciousness through book distribution, Hari now. But then towards the end, he realized that once we establish this Van Ashram, we're not going to grow, you know, we say, organically as a society. And so he wanted. Why work for the material world? You don't have to. There's no need to work. There's no need to work for the non-devotees. Devotees should be self-sufficient. <coughs> or create devotee businesses within the society. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Do you mean, Maharaj, that not only divisions of Varnas and ashrams, but also like self-sufficient communities? That's the basis of the activities, because the self-sufficient communities allow you to practice your Varnas like that. Like that. Yeah, Prabhupada said it can only be established in rural settings, you know, farm communities. Farm communities, he said, are for Grihastas. Brahmacharis will travel and preach, you know, and go in and out of the farms, come to the farms, stay for some time, then go out and preach again. Brahmacharis should always be mobile. <coughs> Brahmacharis, if they stay too long in one place, they get, what we say, what we say, restless. More than they think, oh, maybe I ought to get married. <laughs> <laughs> So keep the brahmacharis and the sannyasis moving. <laughs> the Grihasis can establish the society. That's generally the case. That's generally the case. Brahmacharis should be preachers, not just workers. Every brahmachari should know the shastras and should be able to preach at any time, just like sannyasis. They should be, they're preachers also. Grihastas can preach too, but within the context of their, you know, arrangements. So that's, if we study Prabhupada's instructions, you'll find everything there for the ideal society. And he gave, he even gave the plans how to do it, but we're not doing it yet. <laughs> At least we're not doing it the way Prabhupada wanted it on a large scale. There's some devotees who are focusing on it. I mean, Bhakti Raghava Swami has made it his main service. Completely, he's focused on that. <clears throat> and we're starting something with Kshatriya training now. How to train Kshatriyas. Not only in fighting skills, but in management abilities. Kshatriya has three qualities, three characteristics. He gives protection, he gives welfare and 
to others, and he is also yeah, martial spirited. Prabhupada said, when, if anyone attacks, the Kshatriyas come out and defend, like that. like that. So that has to be there. And then they're good managers, and they also have the tendency to want to care for people. Kshatriyas are like, you know, they have this idea to care for people. They're, some, some of them become policemen, some of them become... You know, in the material world, they become military people. They have that spirit of of honor, spirit of righteousness, the spirit of care for others. That's a Shatriya nature. And they make great managers. They make great managers. You put a Brahmin manager there, he's just saying, yeah, <laughs> I'm detached. Shantris <laughs> <laughs> can't be so detached. The Brahmins, they, if they're not detached, they, can, they can't really be Brahmins. Right? The Brahmins are more on a detached level. Just, you know, whatever happens, it's Krishna's arrangement. <laughs> Try and manage like that. <laughs> Like if you go to a GBC meeting, you can see the difference between the, the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas during the meetings. <laughs> you can tell which ones are the Brahmins and which ones are the Kshatriyas. <laughs> so, anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, so people have different tendencies. And the Vaishya, he has to make money. Uh, he's good at it. There's some people, all they have to do is smile and the money comes to them. <laughs> they don't have to do anything, right? <laughs> they get money just by being there. <laughs> it's just their nature. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, Maharaj, uh, you, know, you get like mixes of the three modes that affect different people. So do you right. get mixes of Chatriya Vasha, Vasha well, Chatra, that kind of stuff? Yeah, Brahmins are in the mode of goodness, Shatris are in the mode of passion, Vaishas are in a mixed mode of ignorance and passion, and Sudras are in the mode of ignorance. That's the, that's the material Vanarsha. But for devotees, we're not any of these modes. <coughs> we're, in, we're practicing Krishna consciousness, which is Sudasat for transcendental. But we have to, in order to keep the society together, there has to be what is called the social body. There's the heads, the arms, the belly, and the legs. <coughs> so everyone has their service, and the service, when it's aligned according to your nature, everything flourishes nicely. That's the whole thing. We're creating, we're creating the social body now, but you know we got sometimes Brahmins doing sutra work and vice versa. You know everything's mixed up in terms. Of, we call it Krishna consciousness, surrender, devotional service, and that's right. You can function like that when you're on the highest platform. When you're on a high platform with spiritual life, you'll do anything, and you'll do it good. But Prabhupada said the training process is the Vanashram system to get people to engage according to their nature, and as they develop transcendent, transcendence, then they may also adjust what services they do. But they won't, because they'll become satisfied in their own service and nature, and they'll be providing so much wonderful service for the society that they'll just continue to function that way. But on the highest platform, yeah, we're not any of these things, you know. And we're not in the modes either. If you listen to the, you can write this down, May, no, March 14th, 1974, morning walk conversation, with in Vrindavan. Prabhupada spoke one hour. Vrindavananda Maharaj is asking a lot of questions to Prabhupada and a few other senior devotees. But it's a very interesting. Prabhupada outlines the whole Vahrashram system in that one lecture. March 14, 1974, morning world conversation in Vrindavan. And there's a few others. There's a room conversation with Hari Sari and a few others. And that's a very, what we say, 
a key one too. That was in 1977. I think it was on something February 25th or something. You can look it up. <coughs> like that. So, yeah. We studied Prabhupada. He, he gave us everything for the perfect society. <coughs> now, the city temples, city temples means you preach. You don't want to live in the cities. We, uh, you want to bring up your children in this kind of environment? It's hell. <laughs> it's hell. So we somehow or other, we just try to establish Guru Kul. And we have these Avanti schools, but not too many people can get into them. What are we going to do when we have children? Are you going to send them to Karmi schools and turn them into like monkeys, you know? This is what it is. This society is so dysfunctional. The kids go to school and they learn all bad things because they learn mostly from their association. Like that. So that's this is a, this is a very big part of our ashram is raising children in the proper environment and giving them what they need to grow spiritually. So, so Prabhupada said, for every city temple, there should be a farm community. I mean, we have Bhakti Vedanta Manor, which is moving in that direction, but it's very restrictive because of the rules and regulations of society. They can't do much. They can't really expand because they have so many, you know, because the nature of the building is that you can't, do, you can't make this change, you can't make that change, you can't do this, you can't do that. And if you want to do this, it takes five years to get the permission. It's so difficult. Look how long it took them just to build that ghost shower. And they had, it took them a year just to get the permission to build it, even more than that. So we want where we can get create these farm communities where we can just work and develop according to you know, our own desires. <coughs> and as far as health is concerned, uh, what you grow on the farms, 100% more nutritious than what you buy in the stores. Mm -hmm. That's the whole thing too. The food we get is not so healthy. Not at all. Most of the nutrients are gone. Nowadays, you have to take so many health supplements just to stay normal. <laughs> it's true. If you saw my list, you'd faint. <laughs> but I take so many things. And so, you know, it's just, it's just not a, a lifestyle for families. For brahmacharis, they're okay. They can move around. <laughs> they're detached. They can preach, they can go here, they can go there. But the ni 85 to 90 percent of our society are people who will are married or will be married. And so you know that's that's the that's the bulk and backbone of the whole society is the grahastas generally. Okay, nine o'clock. I think I said too much. <coughs> Thank you. Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Ramadan Ki Jai, Gaur Premanandi Ki Jai. So let us